Ukraine on edge after deadly clashes between protesters' security forces. By early Friday morning, the lone positive point was that, for the time being, Ukraine's cycle of political and physical infighting was not then at its bloodiest point, as it had hours earlier. Prodded by foreign diplomats, the key players were then talking about not just a bandage for the violence, but also a more long-term political solution. And may be the beginnings of healing. Yet the facts of the last three months, and particularly the last week, show that it's way too early to celebrate or savor any peace. There have been two truces since Sunday. Each of them collapsed suddenly into a carnage centered in self. Kiev's Maiden or Independence Square. The latest bloodshed was also the worst since the unrest began. CNN News crews at the scene reported that as security forces were moving away from the area after the latest truce, a group of protesters pursued them, throwing rocks and Molotov cocktails. Demonstrators did this all under a sky blackened by smoke from their burning barricades, with at least one of them firing toward police lines with a shotgun. Security forces appeared to fight back with automatic weapons and at least one sniper rifle. In video shot by Radio Free Europe, men wearing what appeared to be government uniforms fired at unseen targets with automatic rifles, rifles, and a sniper rifle with a telescopic sight. CNN could not immediately confirm their target. Another video shot by CNN. Shows a medic trying to help a man on the ground being felled by gunfire. In all, more than 100 people died in the fighting Thursday. Protest medical officials said three police officers were killed as well. The Interior Ministry said, even if the final toll is unknown. It is clearly above the previous record mark of at least 26 killed on Tuesday. I'm cleaning blood from the floor, and I'm crying because this is really hard for me," said a man named Anton, who was volunteering at a protest medical clinic set up in the hotel. Renewed violence. Interior Minister Vitaly Zakharchenko said the violence had been provoked exclu- exclusively by the opposition leaders, echoing an earlier statement from President Viktor Yanukovych's office accusing protesters of breaking the truce. The opposition used the negotiation period to buy time to mobilize and get weapons to protesters. The statement from the president's office said, "However, a doctor volunteering to treat protesters, Olga Bogomolov, accused government forces of shooting to kill, saying she had treated 13 people she believed." Had been targeted by professional snipers. They were shot directly to their head, to their hearts, their brain, and to their neck. She said, "They didn't give any chance to doctors for us to save lives." CNN could not independently confirm Boko Molov's claim of sniper fire at a hotel that had been converted into a triage center. Bodies covered in bloody 
flooded sheep lay on the floor, or the dog priest prayed for over them. The interior ministry admit, admitted Thursday that its four forces used firearms, explaining that it only did so to protect unarmed police who were in danger. Ukraine's parliament later passed a resolution that security forces should not stop using guns something that's already illegal for protesters, back off from their positions around naming and denounced the anti-terror operation that had been announced earlier. But whether this Thursday night resolution, which doesn't need the president's signature, has an impact remains to be seen. To be seen. In a statement that appeared to increase pressure on protesters, the Interior Ministry said it reserved the right to use force to free about 70 police officers. It said had been taken hostage Thursday by protesters. However, a number of people purporting to be police officers appeared on Ukrainian television, saying they had joined protesters of their own free will. It wasn't clear whether those claiming to be police officers were among those allegedly taken hostage. There was no sign of any captives when CNN crew went Thursday night to where they were thought to be held. A human rights group earlier claimed that any police who'd been held against their will had been released. In one way, at least, he got back to a semblance of normality Thursday in addition to announcing his resignation from Ukraine's ruling party. The city's mayor, Volodymyr Makinko, reopened the city's mass transit system, which government officials had shut down to prevent protesters from reaching Independence Square. But the unrest wasn't just a tithe. Anti-government protesters have also hit the streets in Lviv, about 540 kilometers west of Kharkiv, near the Polish border, among other locales, such sentiment is particularly prevalent, prevalent in western Ukraine, which is more likely to side with Europe and against Yanukovych, Ukraine's east. Meanwhile, has tended to support him and closer ties to Russia. The people gathering here represent every demographic of the city, said Jason Francisco, an Emory University professor who was one of many to submit CNN I reports from the view. It is fair to say that the city is virtually entirely behind the provision. And this accounts for perhaps the most conspicuous thing about the situation here. The security presents is virtually non-existent. Roots of the crisis the violence in flames, a crisis that started in November, where Yanukovych reversed a decision to sign a trade deal with the European Union, and instead turned toward Russia. Ukraine's population has long been divided between historic loyalty to Europe and its eastern neighbor. The political strife has since ballooned well beyond that one issue. However, including the opposition's pressing constitutional reforms and to shift powers away from the president and to parliament. 
Parliament, and the bloodshed this get week has gotten the world's attention. British Prime Minister David Cameron, for instance, talked by phone Thursday with his Polish counterpart, counterpart as well as Russian President Vladimir Putin, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, and U.S. President Barack Obama also discussed the Ukraine. U.S. Vice President Joe Biden talked late Thursday with Yanukovych, who has also been in touch with U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. In comments Thursday, the U.N. leader called for genuine dialogue and said he was appalled by the use of firearms by both the police and protesters. Even as he stressed it is cru crucial, especially that authorities exercise restraint. Russia, for one, has said it will send a mediator near at Yanukovych's request to negotiate with the opposition. But the Russian ambassador to the UN, Vitaly Cherkin, said his government doesn't believe the opposition wants to dialogue. He accused protest leaders of invading government facilities as a build up to a takeover of parliament. We think that this attempt to execute a violent coup should stop, he said. Contrast that opinion to those expressed by Western officials who have generally put more of the blame and the responsibility on the Ukrainian government. U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Geoffrey Pyatt, told CNN on Thursday that ex Streams on both sides are gathering strength because of the instability. Even then, Pyatt said it's very clear that for the United States, the preponderance of the responsibility rests with the President Yanukovych. Our position is that President Yanukovych needs to lead his country into a new future and he needs to do so through the vehicle of a new government change to the constitution and the political order. Diplomatic efforts underway. After meeting in urgent session in Brussels, European Union officials agreed to freeze the assets of Ukrainians. Ukrainians deemed responsible for the violence and to prevent them from traveling into a European Union, the organization said in a statement. There is widespread horror in the European Union as well as in the United Kingdom at the scale of the loss of innocent life and the events of the last 48 hours. British Foreign Minister William Hart said, the move comes a day after the United States announced it would give visas to 20 people, including government officials tied to the unrest. Washington is also preparing an order to seize assets to Ukrainians who are believed to be involved in the crackdown, a senior administration official said Thursday. It's likely President Barack Obama will sign the order later in the day, but his administration is closely watching diplomatic efforts on the ground to make sure such a move won't be counterproductive, the administration official said. The foreign ministers of Germany, France, and Poland met Thursday in Kiev. Ka Ka the opposition leaders and Yanukovych, the plane they have planned, planned 
to attend the Brussels meeting. The talks went longer than expected. A German foreign ministry spokeswoman told CNN. Late Thursday, Polish Foreign Minister Radoslaw Sikorski said via Twitter that the hours-long talks involving all sides had led to some progress, but important differences remain. This comment came as Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk said there is a proposal before Yanukovych for election this year. The formation of the new government within 10 days of that election and revision to the constitution by the summer, according to a statement from Tusk's office. Pyatt and U.S. ambassadors also say it was his understanding that Yanukovych had opened up to the idea of early elections. Russia's foreign ministry appeared to criticize Western diplomatic efforts, according to a report by Russian state news agency Rusk Novosti. The ongoing attempts to obtrusively intervene from outside, threat with sanctions, or trying to influence the situation in any other ways are inappropriate and can't lead to anything good but can only aggravate the confrontation. The report quoted spokesman Alexander Lukashevich analyzes where there was little that outside pressure could do, especially if the Ukrainian military gets involved on the side of the government tracking down on protesters. My own hunch, said Council on Foreign Relations President Richard Hayes, is this is going to continue to escalate. Murder charges against Venezuela's opposition leader dropped. Venezuelan prosecutors dropped the most serious charges, charges against opposition polit politician, politician Leopoldo Lopez, whom the country's government blames for inciting clashes that have left at least five people dead. Lopez, one of the leading opposition figures in Venezuela, was formally charged with arson and conspiracy. But murder and terrorism charges were dropped, were dropped said his attorney, Julian, jo, Juan Carlos Gutierrez. If convicted, Lopez could face up to 10 years in prison. Lopez's Legal team welcomed the reduced charges. Through it, criticized the way the judicial process was being carried out. Wednesday night's hearing to charge Lopez and determine whether he would be released or remain behind bars took place in an unusual spot. A bus parked outside the prison where he is being held. It seems very unorthodox, Gutierrez told CNN and Espanol. The initial court appearance was to take place in a courtroom, but because of security concerns, officials wanted to move it to the prison. Gutierrez argued that inside a prison was not a proper venue for a hearing. So the strange solution was reached. The best, the bus turned courtroom parked just outside the facility. The prison outside the capital, Caracas, is a military facility and Lopez's 
Defense has raised questions about why a civilian is being held there. The response was that it was a place where the government could guarantee his safety. Gucci Ray said Lopez turned himself into authorities this week in a dramatic scene before tens of thousands of supporters he had called to the street. Anti-government protests in recent weeks are the largest demonstration that President Nicolas Maduro has faced in his 11 months in power. The arrest. During the demonstration, supporters of the country's socialist government and anti-government protesters have flooded social media with reports of violence, making drastically different claims about who is behind it. Since February 13, more than 2,000 stories from Venezuela have been up uploaded in to iReport. CNN's user-generated platform. Many of the videos and photos depict violent scenes between demonstrators and government forces. Alejandro Camacho Biomont told iReport that students Wednesday blocked streets and burned debris in San Cristobal from where he sent photos and he said he didn't blame them. Even though I'm always looking for a peace to make a better place to live, I think people have the right to express themselves in the ways they can, and it is not easy to express yourself in this country now, he said. I support the protesters. There have been more than 15 years that the majority of the Venezuelan citizens are going through tough times. There are so many problems we have to face every day, and there seems to be not a sincere attitude from the high government officials to rectify them. In a nationally televised Broadcast Wednesday night, Maduro described bullet wounds sustained by government forces during protests and showed videos that he said depicted opposition protesters throwing stones and setting buses ablaze. You think this is a novel? This is the reality that you, with your hatred, have created. He said, if you don't like Venezuela, leave. Reports of violence through condemnation from Henry Carpiles, a leading opposition politician, politician who lost a bid of for the presidency last year. He called for the government to open a dialogue with demonstrators rather than cracking down on dissent. In this hour, or turbulence to the students, to those who are in the street, again we call for you not to step into the trap of violence, he said. Human rights concerns. Human rights groups warn about the danger of turning the protest into a persecution of political opponents. The charges against Lopez, who has organized protests demanding better security and end to shortage, shortages and protected freedom of speech, smack off a politically motivated attempt to silence decent in the country. Amnesty International said in a prepared statement, Human Rights Watch warned that Venezuela must avoid scapegoating political opponents. Justice, Justice Minister Miguel Rodriguez Torres said Thursday that out of about 200 people who were detained during clashes in the past week, 
only 13 women in jail for offenses that include illegal gun possession and vandalism. Rodriguez Torres ridiculed reports that the Venezuelan state is illegally detaining students in an effort to put an end to the protests. Obama decried false accusations. Major social and economic problems in Venezuela have fueled the protests, but as the demonstrations gained steam, officials had pointed fingers at the other factors, accusing the United States of plotting to destabilize the government. Venezuela expelled three U.S. diplomats this week, accusing them of conspiring to bring down the government at a rally Tuesday. Maduro shouted, Yankee, go home, from the stage, drawing cheers from the crowd. U.S. President Barack Obama fired back at the news conference in Mexico on Wednesday. Venezuela, rather than trying to distract from its own failings by making up false accusations against diplomats from the United States, the government ought to focus on addressing the legitimate grievances of the Venezuelan people, he told reporters. In a television broadcast Wednesday, Maduro accused Colombian paramilitary forces and the United States of feeling and violence, and he vowed, vowed the, to stand firm against any attempts to overthrow his government. And what is the Venezuelan opposition going to do? He said, believe that with the support of U.S. secured Secretary of State John Kerry or Obama, you are going to be able to take political power by violent means. This isn't the first time that bitter protests and counter-protests by supporters and op opponents of the government have threatened political stability in Venezuela over the past decade. Many of Manduro's claims of U.S. intervention of assassination plots were also lobbed by the late President Hugo Chavez. Chavez was briefly out ousted in a coup in 2002 but otherwise outlasted the protest and repeatedly won election. He ruled for 14 years until his death last year after a long battle with cancer. What app? Ten other things Facebook could have bought with 19 billion. Facebook's Acquisition of the hugely popular messaging service WhatsApp for 19 million is one of the largest tech deals in history. It dwarfs Facebook's acquisition of Instagram for 1 million in 2012, and even that was considered an astonishing number by many. Since 19 billion, is a sum most of us can hardly comprehend, and because it's fun to imagine, we came up with a list of other things Mark Zuckerberg and his team could have purchased for 19 billion. What would you do if you had that kind of money? That of severely beaten giant's fan cost two sentenced men credence. Two California men were sentenced to prison Thursday for their roles in the severe beating of a San Francisco giant's fan after a game against the Los Angeles Dodgers in 2011. Marvin Norwood, 33, and Louis Sanchez, 31, were sentenced to four years and eight years, respectively. Members of Stowe's family appeared in court and made statements to 
the defendant and the judge during the sentencing. Now, brain damage as a result of the beating still is disabled, disabled and unable to care for himself, said his father David. The time you serve will be insignificant to what Brian must endure. However, the years you spend in prison is what you two prisons deserve, David Stowe said to the two men. Norwood, however, was scheduled to be released with credit for time served. He had been in jail in case in the case for more than two years. Federal authorities plan to take Norwood into custody if released by local authorities because Norwood faces a federal charge of a being a felon in possession of firearms, said spokesman. Don't mosaic with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles. Earlier in the day, Norwood pleaded guilty to felony assault by means likely to produce great bodily injury. Sanchez pleaded guilty to felony mayhem. In exchange for their guilty pleas, other felony charges were dropped against the defendants. Both men are from Rialto, California. The Dodgers issued a statement saying, We are pleased that the culpable parties have finally accepted responsibility for their actions and have been sentenced for their crimes. The baseball team declined to comment further because the Stowe family is suing the organization in connection with the beating and the stadium security. Prosecutors say the men attacked Brian Stowe, now 45, in a Dodger Stadium parking lot after the opening day game on March 31, 2011. The paramedic from Santa Cruz went into a coma as a result of the beating and, after returning to consciousness, is still struggling with a severe brain injury. The man who appeared in court in handcuffs were harshly criticized with Judge George Longley. Mr. Stowe will be forever trapped in a medical condition that the man put him in, he said during the sentencing. I have to comment on the attack, which was absolutely brutal. You blindsided, Mr. Stowe, the judge said. You are a complete coward. Sanchez smirked during the judge's up admonishment. You show no remorse whatsoever, Longlet added. At the end of the day, it was only a game and you lost perspective. A statement from the district attorney's office that Sanchez attacked Stowe from behind in an unprovoked attack and witnesses testify that Norwood prevented Stowe's friends from helping him. Caregivers and family members shower dress to feed Stowe, who takes 13 medications a day, said Sister Bonnie Stowe. No sentencing you receive will be long enough, she told the defendants. Your lack of regret makes me despise you even more. Another sister, Erin Collins, said the damage to her brother's brain was catastrophic. A shunt now protrudes on the right side of his skull, and its left side is slightly sunken. His skull has deep scars. Because of your actions, Brian can't go to the bathroom by himself, Collins said. He has to wear adult diapers. I hate having to say that out loud, but it shows the severity of what you did. Being here, I hope to see one tiny bit of remorse in order to not think you are both that despicable. But I don't. How can we begin to consider forgiveness when you aren't even asking for it? Colin said. Collins 
also read aloud in court a statement written by Stowe's wife that was directed to the defendant. Our son, Tyler's first word was ball, his next word was daddy, and when they started playing catch, Brian promised to play catch with him every day, and he did until you took that away from him. Our daughter, Tabitha, loved to ride bags with her daddy and he did that every day he could, again, until you both took that away. Based on your actions, it is completely obvious that you have no respect for human life. Venezuela, what's the crisis about? Venezuelans have taken to the streets in recent days, leading to gruesome clashes between protesters and police. Their demands are varied. From economic to social, here's a Q&A to bring you up to speed with what's going on. When did the protest in Venezuela begin? Nation nationwide student protests started this month. On February 12, the demonstration attracted global attention where three people were killed. Demonstrators are demanding better security an end to goods to good shortages shortages and protected freedom of speech. Major social and economic problems have fueled the protests, but as the demonstrations gain steam, officials have pointed fingers at other factors and accused the United States of plotting to destabilize the government. Some blame Venezuela's government led by President Nicolas Maduro for those problems. Maduro and other officials blame the opposition for the security and economic problems. The protests are the largest Maduro has faced in his 11 months in power. He has called opposition members fascists, fascists and Compare them to an infection that needs to be cured. Who's protesting? Many demonstrators across the country are students. Prominent opposition politicians have also led protests and joined marches. Since February 13, more than 2,000 stories from Venezuela have been uploaded to our report CNN's user generated platform. Many of the videos are photos and photos are gruesome and depict violent scenes between demonstrators and police. Who are some of the opposition figures involved? You'll be hearing a lot of the opposition leader Leopoldo Lopez in the coming days. He's become the opposition space of demonstrations against the government. Lopez was detained this week on terrorism and murder charges, but prosecutors dropped those charges, replacing them with arson and conspiracy counts, his lawyer said Thursday. What did Lopez do? Lopez was arrested in connection with the death of four anti-government protesters and a government supporter in clashes nationwide. He was targeted because he organized protests demanding better security and end to shortages and protected freedom of speech. He has denied the charges which the human rights group Amnesty International said smack off a politically motivated attempt to Silence dissent in the country. Human Rights Watch weighed in too, warning that Venezuela must avoid scapegoating political opponents. You mentioned something about a U.S. plot to destabilize Venezuela. Yes, top Venezuelan officials have accused the United States of trying to destabilize the government. 
This week, Venezuela gave three U.S. diplomats 48 hours to leave the country, accusing them of conspiring, conspiring to bring down the government. At a rally Tuesday, Maduro shouted, Yankee, go home from the state, drawing cheers from the crowd. U.S. President Barack Obama was not amused. Venezuela, rather than trying to distract from its own failings by making up false accusations against diplomats from the United States, the government ought to focus on addressing the legitimate grievances of the Venezuelan people, Obama told reporters. Is this the first time Venezuela has had protests? No. Bitter protests and counter-protests by supporters and often opponents of the government have threatened political stability in Venezuela over the past decade. Many of Maduro's claims of U.S. invention of assassination plots were also loved by the late President Hugo Chavez. Chavez were briefly ousted in the coup in 2002, but otherwise outlasted the protest and repeatedly won the election. He ruled for 14 years until his death last year, after a long battle with cancer. What's the latest? Lopez remained in a military prison Thursday. His wife, Lillian Tintori, the Lopez, called on the borders to keep the pressure on the government. Don't give up, she said. I won't. Lopez's court hearing adjourned early Thursday. Tell me more about Venezuela. Venezuela is on the northern coast of South America and shares a border with Colombia, Brazil, and Guyana. Its former name is the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, the oil-rich nation, one of the world's top 10 oil-exporting countries worldwide, has a population about, of about 30 million. million. What happened to Hugo Chavez? He died of cancer in 